So now let's look at cardiac muscle and the cardiac conduction system, beginning with the structure of the cardiac muscle. The heart is the only muscle that is autorhythmic. That is, it generates its own rhythm from within each and every cell. You can cut a heart up into pieces, and each of those pieces will beat, or you can put it in a beaker of oxygenated saline water, and it'll continue to beat in there all on its own without any nervous input. The cardiocytes are the muscle cells themselves. They're short, striated, and thick branched cells. They have one central nucleus, and they're surrounded by a light staining mass of glycogen, which acts as fuel for the cell. They're connected to each other by intercalated discs. These appear as dark lines that are thicker than the striations that we see in the muscle. An intercalated disc is a complex step-like structure with three distinctive features that are not found in skeletal muscle. Those are these interdigitating folds you can see in the figure at the bottom here. They increase the surface area of contact between the cells. There's also going to be mechanical junctions that join the cardiocytes tightly together. A couple of different types of mechanical junctions would be the fascia adherens, which is a broad band in which the actin of the thin filaments is anchored to the plasma membrane, and then each cell is linked to the next via transmembrane proteins. We'll see those interrupted here and there by desmosomes, which are weld-like mechanical junctions between cells. They're somewhat like rivets. You can see the desmosomes pictured down here in the lower figure. These prevent the cardiocytes from being pulled apart. They're very strong junctions. We'll also see electrical junctions between the cardiocytes, or gap junctions. These allow ion flow between the cells. That means that one cell can stimulate its neighbor. This is what allows the cells to beat in unison. The entire myocardium of either two atria or two ventricles acts like a single unified cell. The atria and the ventricles contract in sort of an off-phase manner, as we'll see soon. Thus, their cells will beat at slightly different rates. Now, cardiac muscle lacks any satellite cells, so it cannot repair itself with normal tissue. So most repair of cardiac muscle is going to be fibrosis. That means once the tissue dies, it's just replaced with scarring. So cardiac muscle depends almost exclusively on aerobic respiration. This makes sense because it has to beat on and on and on. It uses aerobic respiration to make its ATP. Because it makes its own ATP, we're going to see that it's rich in myoglobin as well as mitochondria. The myoglobin is going to hold on to oxygen. Glycogen will act as a fuel. And these huge mitochondria are going to produce the ATP. The mitochondria in a cardiac muscle cell fill almost 25% of the cell. You can see them pictured down here in this lower figure. Very, very big mitochondria. We don't want to run out of energy in the heart cells. Cardiocytes are highly adaptable in the type of fuels that they use. At rest, they'll use predominantly 60% fatty acids, 35% glucose. They'll use some ketones, lactic acid, and amino acids. The cardiac muscle is much more vulnerable to oxygen deficiency than lack of a specific fuel due to its adaptability. Cardiocytes are extremely fatigue resistant. This is because it makes very little use of anaerobic fermentation. It doesn't create an oxygen debt, and thus it doesn't fatigue. It's pretty amazing. It doesn't fatigue for a whole lifetime. So each of these cardiocytes has its own autorhythmic qualities. But how do we coordinate them all to beat together and push blood from chamber to chamber throughout the heart? That's the cardiac conduction system. It's involved in coordinating the heartbeat. It's composed of an internal pacemaker and nerve-like conduction pathways through the myocardium. 
It generates and conducts rhythmic electrical signals in the following order. We begin with the SA node. You can see the SA node right here by number one. This initiates the heartbeat and determines the heart rate. From this pacemaker, the signal spreads throughout the right atrium. It then spreads to the AV node, which is located near the right AV valve at the lower end of the interatrial septum right here. It is the electrical gateway to the ventricles. The fibrous skeleton of the heart acts as an insulator that prevents the currents from getting to the ventricles by any other route. Because the fibrous skeleton has no conductivity, it blocks the signal, so it must pass through this AV node. From the AV node, we'll see the signal passed down through the atrioventricular bundle, or the bundle of Hiths, here at number 4 moves down through the interventricular septum towards the apex of the heart. Here, the signal spreads out along Purkinje fibers as it wraps around the bottom of each ventricle and passes the signal up around the side of the heart. The signal is passed from cell to cell through these gap junctions. So there's no accident here. The signal needs to be passed down to the apex of the heart so that the contraction to empty the ventricles can begin at the lower portion and squeeze the blood up and out through its respective vessels. If it started contraction at the top, we'd never see the ventricles emptying properly into the great vessels. Pause here for a moment, close your books, and diagram the cardiac conduction system, including the SA node, the AV node, the bundle of Hiss, and the Purkinje fibers, and explain how the signal is passed from one place to the other. So how is all of this coordinated? The sympathetic nerves will raise heart rate. You remember sympathetic fight or flight. We need to increase heart rate and get out of there. The sympathetic pathway to the heart originates in the lower cervical and upper thoracic segments, as you'll recall from Anatomy and Physiology 1. They continue to adjacent sympathetic chain ganglia, and they pass through cardiac plexuses in the mediastinum, and they continue as cardiac nerves to the heart. The fibers terminate in the SA and AV nodes in the atrial and ventricular myocardium, as well as in the aorta, the pulmonary trunk, and the coronary arteries. These increase heart rate and contraction strength, and they dilate the coronary arteries to increase myocardial blood flow. We'll also see parasympathetic innervation. The rest and digest naturally is going to slow the heart rate. These pathways begin in the nuclei of the vagus nerves in the medulla oblongata, they extend to the cardiac plexus and continue by way of cardiac nerves to the heart. Fibers of the right vagus nerve lead to the SA node, and fibers of the left vagus nerve will lead to the AV node. There's little or no vagal stimulation in the actual myocardium itself. Thus, the parasympathetic input is purely about stimulation of the SA and AV nodes in order to reduce the heart rate. So I'm not so interested in you knowing the pathways of the nerve supply, but just that the parasympathetic is going to slow the heart rate and it's involved in the SA and AV node only. And that sympathetic is about raising the heart rate and it's about increasing the heart rate as well as the contraction strength by influencing the atrial and ventricular myocardium in addition to the SA and AV nodes. Also that the sympathetic input has an influence on the coronary arteries. That brings us to the end of this section. We'll explore further the electrical and contractile activity of the heart in the next section.